design it. <laughs> gotta let me start it. Okay. Um, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to this session. Um, this is a design challenge. And the reason it's a design challenge is because we don't think we can solve homelessness. And the thing of it is we're educators and learning designers, and we often have a habit of of trying to solve to try to solve everything. And and this is a huge problem and a crisis. And in and it's a and if you heard our key, if you heard our keynote, this isn't a trauma. We we don't think we're going to be able to solve this or give best tips or 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 things like best best practices. Um, but we think that we can respectfully discuss this. We think that we can consider it as learning designers, and we can consider it as educators and also administrators, and. If we want, and if anybody wants to go back and and to watch um, Hannah Grossman's um, keynote, there are some models there probably too that we can go ahead and use. And and like I said, the reason this is a design challenge is is because we're not going we're not going to show you something and go okay, so this is how you take care of everything and it's all solved and we don't have to think about it again. Um, we're going to look at it in like two different ways. One in how you bring this into, how you bring the crisis and the discussion of it and projects into your classroom. And then we're also going to talk about um, if you have students who are unhoused, what you can possibly do and design for that that would be able to help these students or or at the very least cause no more trauma. Um, the way that we're gonna get started is um, Elena and um, Elena and I um, and Brandon just put in there, can we do a sequel on incarceration? I think that we should do such that we absolutely need to do sessions on that also. Um, what we're going to start with is um, I'm a doctoral student in Elena and our our other our third person in our group, um, Leah Bookholtz, we're doctoral students and we're doing a project in a course and I'm going to give it over to Elena to start talking about that to begin with. Yes, well, we're in a we're in a, uh, a wonderful course with the power of data, and we're really looking at the issues of how to use data in more equitable and just ways to address some of the complex issues that we're facing, including this one. And um, out of that conversation, initial conversation as part, we were we were charged with having creating an assignment around a, a, a topic of interest. And um, we started discussing things and we talked, you know, really was driven, you know, Kay was the was the person that kind of drove drove the waters, as we say. So um, but we found out in this discussion when we talked about this uh, topic, um, I used to work in Head Start. I worked in Head Start for many years as a family services um, support person. And um, we uh, we started to talk a little bit about McKinney Vento. So McKinney Vento is was We'll learn a little bit more about that later, but um, it requires that if you are faced with children who are um, uh, needing to attend preschool, that if the if the family is unhoused and the child is unhoused, that's automatic requirement to accept be accepted into Head Start without any problems. Sometimes you have to provide documentation and things like that, and we know that that is a challenge if you are facing this 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 issue personally. So um so that got us thinking about how is this um how is this uh data collected in terms of who who is who who gets these services in the in the public education system how is how are how are families and children being supported and um we found when we looked at some of the data there were a lot of gaps around um, the numbers. We know that that homelessness and, and not having housing is, a, is an increasing problem across our country. And we were surprised to find that there seemed to be gaps in some of the data around that. And so we began to ask the question, well, why is that happening? And so we're, we're, we don't know the answer to that quite yet, but uh, we're working on a project around that. Did I do okay with that one? Yeah, yeah, perfect. <laughs> I'll, I'll just, uh, and, and the thing of it is, I should let you know that as we're doing this project, Charles and Eric, were, as far as I'm concerned, were my consultants. 
on on talking on talking about oh gosh this doesn't look right okay <laughs> so so the, the thing of it is we, we focused on the state of colorado every state's going to have this so the reason we're mentioning this is so if you are bringing it in as a project this can even be in a statistics class um, the class that Elena and I are in is a, a, a critical quantitative class, okay? It is part of a culturally responsive methodology a program. And, and, the thing, and the thing about it is that, so anything with math and numbers, there's possibilities here. And, and there's a justice, social justice aspect to this about numbers and counting and people um, being counted, uh, people, you know, decide opting to not be counted. And the big problem that we saw is that there's, and, and we'll talk, uh, and Charles and Eric, of course, could go into this, but, but maybe we'll cover it, maybe we'll cover it enough so that you can go into even more impactful things. But Data data set wise, there's these two key places where there's sets of data. One of them is, and Elaine is going to talk about it a little bit more. It's called McKinney Vento, and go ahead and Google it, or or Brandon, you go ahead and find that link for McKinney Vento. Um, it it that's K through twelve. There's another thing. There's another thing. There's another count that's called a point in time count. And I can quickly share screen with that. Now the point in time count, and and Eric has Eric has been <laughs> did this this year. So, but he'll be talking about like other aspects. But the other big statistical, you know, like counting thing is this point in time count that is done, um, by and, and sent into the um in the U.S. in the Department of uh, Housing and Urban Development and funding and funding for community uh, funding for communities to help people who are unhoused depends on this data. OK, just like what um, Elena will be talking about is is there's this dependency on the data. Well, the thing that the, that we found out is there's a, a problem with the data that you get from here and the data that Elaine is going to talk about. And I know that sounds very that sounds very abstract, but it, it pinpoints a lot of problems and there's discussions and things that your students can talk about either qualitative or quantitatively. Um, this point in time count is, Volunteer, volunteer, some volunteers and also staff um, for these organizations go physically go and talk to the people on a specific day or days to find out the number of unhoused people according to the HUD definition of being of being homeless, and and that that's all I'm going to talk about when it comes to that saying that we are able to get this data um it's available to the it's available to the public once hud gets it it's available to the public and you can get this data now elena you, please explain one of the problems <laughs> one of the problems is who's collecting this data and how they're collecting this data and where is the consistency and is there consistency and the answer is, is no there is not <laughs> <laughs> we think we think there's not. Um, there are people that are established within the school systems for McKinney Vento, for example, that are McKinney Vento liaisons. And those people are supposed to be collecting. They're the supposed to be the people who are uh, charged with doing outreach into communities, doing enrollment, making sure that uh, family children are receiving and, and young people are receiving the services that they're entitled to legally. Um, but as you can imagine, what we found when we started to look at, for example, the the titles of the of different people within the school who were supposed to be doing this they were very varied and they varied from um, people who have administrative positions have district positions people that are working with community organizations within the communities so they have very solid ties with 
the agencies that are supposed to be providing support and help around food, housing, et cetera, um, to, you know, the, the secretary in the school is the person who's doing this. The person who is the principal, but is also the bus rider is doing this. Like it's very, very, very varied. And in some cases, there are even some gaps. There aren't people in these positions. So how is that data being collected if nobody's collecting it? Um, so there are problems with, with the fact that there are two different counts going on. There, there are problems with who is collecting it, but there's inconsistency. Um, we are going to be doing a little bit of analysis in our group about uh, and to see a little bit deeper what is actually happening, but just off the, off the, on the surface, um, we can see that there is some, there is some, there are vast differences. There, there's a lot of variance in, in, in who collects the data and how, and how and what position they have within the school system. So you can imagine that it might be a case where you have tighter ties to the community, where you, for example, if there's a large Spanish speaking population or, a, or there are other languages within the community, people who speak those languages and are can have connections to those um, deep connections with community connections might be a little bit better at knowing who needs support it rather than someone who is not in that. And so that's a little bit of my, my own bias creeping in there, but I, 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 um, yeah, just on the surface of it, that's what we found. Kay, is there anything else that, that, um, well, the, the other thing that we found, and I know I immediately went to Charles about this, <laughs> um, that there is reporting in counties in Colorado that there are, there is no one who's there's no one there. There's no data, which, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that, that's that possible, right? Yeah, the the yeah. school district there 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 are no students who are considered unhoused according to a McKinney Vinto definition, which is a very is w way broader than the the point in contact one. So the the reason the reason we're we're bringing this up is because here's an example of how we think a project where we think you can respectfully. Um, bring in the topic and the crisis um, and have your students do something that's real. We we expect to have a real report from this. <laughs> I, I mean, it, we, we expect that we'll be able to say something, uh, that we'll be able to say something from this and that we'll be able to disseminate it. So that was our, our, our first example to start you, to, to start you out. Um, now I'm going to introduce Charles. Charles is one of my students. <laughs> Charles took uh, um, took the de design thinking and research methodology, and um, it's it's pretty it, it's business for the creative industries. But as long as it's nonprofit, you know it pretty it, we're pretty broad when it comes to that. So I'll let Charles talk about like what he has been doing. Okay. Well, first of all, I am a student at Front Range Community College. I am, like Kay said, working on my Bachelor of Applied Science in Business for Creative Industries. I just received my Associates of Applied Science in Horticulture and Landscape Technologies this past December at the ripe young age of 52. Um, this is me returning to school at, in 2019 after being absent for almost 30 years. So... Uh, it was a rough transition, but I made it, and I'm doing it well. I did get my associates with honors, so I'm kind of proud of that. Um, but why did I choose the subject of homelessness? Well, I've got a couple of reasons for that. Uh, first, because a few times in my life, I have been one of the unhoused, thus making this a very personal subject for me. Um, second, because not since the 80s have we seen so many families becoming unhoused. Family homelessness is one of the fastest rising groups amongst the homeless and we as a nation are not ready to handle this. Um, we don't know how to handle it. Um, third, we as a nation still have so many negative biases towards the unhoused um, and most of which have no valid reasoning backing them up. Um, and so I, I have an issue with that. Finally, this country is really good at punishing the unhoused, um, but not so great at figuring out what their needs are and what it's going to take for them to go from being unhoused to being self-sufficient and housed again. Um, 
punishing that house brings me to part of my personal story. Um, every state, county, city, township, and so on has their own set of rules and regulations regarding the unhoused. Um, for example, in Fort Collins, there's a complete and total unique set of rules and regulations that pertain to what you can and cannot do in public spaces. Um, and, cam and camping outside of a campground anywhere in Fort Collins will receive you a hefty fine and you could potentially lose your belongings if you can't grab them quickly enough and walk away with them. Um, versus Birmingham, Alabama, where it's practically illegal to be homeless, period. Um, there's ways around that called trespassing. Um, both charges carried the same weight, uh, 72 hours to 30 days incarceration. Uh, it all depends on the judge's mood that day. Mm. Um, I'm going to start my story in Atlanta, Georgia in 2012, where as an unhoused person, you must be 100% visible to law enforcement uh, from dusk till dawn. This means you are either sleeping or sitting on a sidewalk all night long, not walking around, not in the shadows, not in a park. Uh, no entrance of any businesses, whether they're open or closed, uh, not in an alley, and definitely not in a residential neighborhood. I learned this law totally by accident and spent 20 days in jail because of it. I had fallen asleep against the base of a tree facing the sidewalk, but unfortunately, I was just inside, about a foot, two foot the boundary of a public park after hours. I was held for 72 hours prior to my even being sentenced and was given no leeway by the judge for being out of town, um, not familiar with the laws and that I was terribly sorry for violating them. Judge didn't care. Nope, I was guilty of illegally using a public place after hours, specifically a park after dark. Um, and charged with $1,500 as my fine. I was given to the end of that court session to pay that fine, or I would be returned to the Atlanta Detention Center until said time that I had served the time to make up the payments. Um, they were going to give me $75 per 24 hours, which is actually kind of generous, um, but no one could make any payments towards that amount after court had ended. And I'm trying to figure out exactly how did they expect me to pay anything when they'd already taken away my wallet, they'd already taken away my cell phone, and I was literally chained to the guy next to me on both sides at my ankles, my waist, and my wrist. So how was I supposed to make a payment then? I really was just visiting, and when... I was finally released. My ride had long since returned to Alabama. And now comes the fun part. Because I was homeless and had been detained longer than 14 days, they had sent my backpack, my wallet, my money, my cell phone, clothes, and my phone charger away from the detainment center and had shipped them to a holding center that's on the very edge of the city and the county. Here I am being released at 7 a.m. on a Saturday morning. The holding center closes at 445 and it's 36 miles away. So now what am I supposed to do? Well, I took matters into my own hands and I broke another law now. I very stealthily and quickly jumped the turnstile and got on the train platform and took the train going west to the very end of the line, which left me another 12 and a half miles of walking to do. Now, I did get to the holding center before 445. I got there at 440. I was soaking wet, uh, blisters on my feet, cold as I'll get out because it had been storming all afternoon. I got my stuff at exactly 4.45 and was immediately 
told to leave the premises and get off the property. I put on a jacket and started the 200 mile walk back to my camp, which was in Birmingham, Alabama. That's a whole nother story. But this story is just an example of how quickly things can become desperate. Um, I actually had to break another couple laws just in that simple little trip. I actually panhandled in Southwest Atlanta, one of the poorest and worst neighborhoods to even drive through, let alone walk. And that, it, it, you just become really, really desperate. So I had a couple of projects that I did. One of mine was an actual whole workshop on uh, the camping issue in uh, Fort Collins and whatnot. And a spur off of that is actually what I want to share with y'all today. Um, it's where I was asked to look at the whole um, design for a data walk or for a surveillance walk and come up with something for the wellness committee at uh, the Larimer campus of Front Range. So this is what I came up with for them. Go ahead and share my screen real quick. Come on. Okay, why am I not finding what I'm looking for? <laughs> You'll find it soon. And for any of it, what, what Charles was referring to is um, a data or a surveillance walk um, with uh, in data justice um, there. So if you look up data, <laughs> data walk, um, you'll find in with data justice, what that is, is like a surveillance walk where you walk a, a specific community to see where the cameras are. So that so that you can look in and see how you're how how you're actually being surveilled. So there's some of those on the internet that are uh, that are decent. And um, so Charles took that as as mainly as um, inspiration, I'd say, <laughs> and then and then um, he created this project. Let's see. Hopefully, I'm getting there. Uh, it's not pulling up the screen I want. All right. Let's see. There's a different tab that's a PowerPoint. Um, it might yes. be blocked by the Zoom controls as well. Okay. But Maybe at the so very top left. All right. I apologize, y'all. No, um, no, it, it, no worries. It happens every single time. I yes, share. <laughs> it does. <laughs> <laughs> like, I can never find find it ever. <laughs> yeah, it's like the one thing I'm looking for, and I can't yeah, find it. Always, always. Sometimes yeah. it helps if you click on it, and then you like you have it up on your screen, like, and then and then try to do the share because it'll appear. I don't know. I'm saying that as a, someone who knows absolutely nothing about what I'm talking about. <laughs> Well, what I'm going to try to do, let's see if I can get it to move to the desktop. Anyway, all right, it's not working. So I'm just going to go ahead and basically read it to you. Um, yeah, talk it, talk us through it. Because it basically, I started off with a picture that says housing is a human right. Um, that's a bold statement and it gets people's attention. And that's what this artist that is painting this on the side of a fence is trying to get you to do is start thinking about it. So is housing a human right? I think it is. But what happens when someone or a whole family becomes homeless? So this was done for Fort Collins. So picture the delightful old town area of Fort Collins, a place that we cherish deeply. And it's no surprise that our vibrant town is frequently the recipient of many accolades uh, from best place to live in the United States to best place to raise a family and so on and so forth. Now, in the heart of Old Town Fort Collins is 
our lovely old town and you cannot go to Disney World without actually seeing our old town. Um, Disney was so inspired by the city of Fort Collins, he actually turned that into part of the village that's there at Disney World. Oh. So even with this, you've got, it's a public space and it's a significant tourist attraction. But the question arises, who really owns public spaces? And the realization that social norms and laws restrict public space access, favoring certain groups is kind of upsetting. Uh, this contradicts the principle of inclusiveness these spaces should uphold, especially amidst the persistent issue of homelessness. Um, on weekends here in town, this being a college town, our youth uh, tend to bring life to the streets, occasionally overindulging in drink. Um, we as community protectors step in only for serious issues. Their activities boost the economy and tax income. And since families and children are not around at night, who's, it re who's really at the effect of the youthful antics? So we scrutinize the homeless for every minor infraction that we have here in town. Um, creating rules to manage their public conduct. And it's a misconception that they have equal public space rights, especially around family areas. Um, everyone's respect for everyone is essential. So we have to ask ourselves if we generally treat the unhoused with the dignity they actually deserve. Now, during the winter here in Fort Collins, we offer shelter nightly to select adults who qualify based on specific cr criteria. Limited space is also available for entire families that meet extremely specific requirements and they have to obtain their approval for housing during business hours. Um, this leaves many homeless without shelter and what happens to them? Where do they go? Um, now it is true that setting up tent cities or camping in Fort Collins might seem like a temporary solution, uh, but it's far from, my, far from my ideal. And even those experiencing homelessness would agree with you on that one. Um, local regulations around camping are stringent to say the least, and attempts to set up camp can lead to expensive fines and your belongings end up thrown away if they cannot be carried with you. And it sounds harsh, yet these fines accumulate unpaid and jail is indeed a possibility for not paying your fines. Um, That's just the reality of the situation here. Now, I wish I had my pictures because there's a great picture that shows a gem, portrays a gentleman sitting at his little tent. He's got a sign that says, once I was like you. Now that often leads to misconceptions. The reality, he did share similarities with you. He was probably educated, employed, and housed at one point. Um, do not assume to know his story uh, because the likelihood of you being right about his story is very, very slim. Every single unhoused individual has their own story and it's most times not what you think it is. Um, of course, the fastest growing group in homelessness today is families. They live in their cars, hotels, legal campsites. They don't have permanent housing. Rising housing costs nationwide are causing the numbers to surge. And we must prepare for an expected increase in homeless families. Um, regret regrettably, in our capitalist society, where economic gain often takes precedence, acts of kindness sometimes feel rare and precious. Um, there are indeed those among us whose hearts overflow with genuine care and compassion. Oh, there we go. I found, I found your I found your slides. There we go. Okay. okay so <laughs> this Great. is that starting slide. Yep. Housing is a human right. There we I'm going to move forward to where you were. I think you were just here and now you're here. Uh, next one, I believe. Hey! There we go. Um, good souls who long to express their warmth openly, however, 
due to the current social climate, unfortunately, it's challenging for them to freely display such virtues without fear or hesitation. Uh, the next image, which is very close to my heart, symbolizes our shared mission to ensure everyone has a warm and stable home, reflecting the powerful idea that housing is a human right. While the distance from this dream to reality remains unclear, I'm encouraged by the increasing commitment to make this right universal, affirming that having a place to call home should be accessible to all. Now, what roles Front Range play in the homelessness crisis? We begin to understand our part when we genuinely acknowledge the situation with open eyes, minds, and hearts. The unhoused do not need our pity or misguided assumptions. They require empathy, compassion, respect, and appropriate support. Here we got a traditional data walk uh, where information is compiled, presented, and individuals from the community and leaders and so on get in little intimate groups and they discuss what information is there. Walk a mile in her shoes is a awesome international march uh, to prevent rape and all those wonderful things. I borrowed kind of their name and said their shoes. Mm -hmm. um, now, Fort Collins has an awesome transportation system. Uh, they really do. And it's free of charge to everybody. So it, ha it has become the primary source of transportation for the unhoused in the city. Um, this is actually one of the best and most organized systems I've seen worldwide. Now, I've included with the people that are gonna be on that little transportation trip, a map of Fort Collins from the actual homeless resource guide that's very detailed and gives exact locations and what services are provided in the area uh, to the unhoused. Um, I, I would arrange for us to visit Homeward Alliance and Murphy Center for Hope. Uh, this is the primary hub basically for all of Fort Collins homeless services and they do a pretty good job with the resources they have. Fort Collins Rescue Mission has been given a ton of government money. Um, and they've got great design, except the neighborhood that wants to go next to for the new place doesn't want them there. So they made an arrangement to put up an eight foot fence. Not cool. <laughs> uh, makes it look like more like a containment facility than an actual shelter and it still only is functioning for men not for families not for women so after we'd gone on this little bus tour and whatnot you come back to front range and you get involved in an interactive, interactive discussion and hopefully you learn some things while you were out there um got got to talk to some of the people because they will say hello um, but here we are, this is Fort Collins, beautiful Fort Collins, and Fort Collins has a choice. They can, excuse me, struggling with the housing shortage and rising homelessness, Fort Collins is at a crossroads. We must reflect on our future. Can we preserve our unique qualities and continue to shine as a community under pressure? And if we do shine, well, because we're exclusive or inclusive? That's a crucial question for all of us. How we might be of assistance to the homeless here at Front Range? Well, we can start by hosting events like this or something like it to help educate people about the facts about being unhomed, unhoused. Not pre-programmed, not preconceived notions and negative stigma, we just have to ask, how might we, how might we actually help? So that, that was it. Thank you. So, so this, this project was, a, this was a design project in a design thinking class, but also along with this, I saw Rubina just, uh, just had to leave and she said it was very powerful. <laughs> um, but this, this is an example of doing a project that 
in that enacts design justice also. So, Eric, <laughs> Eric, you're up next, and you have a different perspective. Well, I mean, the first thing I have to say is thank you, Charles. Uh, there is nothing that compares to direct live, lived experience and sharing. Um, and maybe, I, I know questions usually happen at the end, but I don't want to just like hear that and drop it. So if anyone has any questions for Charles before I jump in with data and stuff again, um, does anybody have anything you want to say? And and Eric, we're finding the, that our conference is when when things are really impactful, nobody has any, everybody's just taking it in. Yeah. <laughs> and and that, when we're being chatty, <laughs> you know, we're being too chatty. It's like, we're like, oh, we know this, but we get really quiet. Mm. And and that's fine too. And and I just want to acknowledge a little transition before uh, just jumping in and saying, hey, look at this. <laughs> uh, but I will do that. So uh, I also okay. actually don't know how my screen sharing is going to go because um, I haven't done it with this setup yet. So we'll see what happens when I when I start uh, the the PowerPoint at least. But I think what I'm going to do first is share this. Uh, you should just be seeing a web browser that says Supreme Court and homelessness: what the Grants Pass versus Johnson case could do. Uh, this speaks, Charles, to your situation. So in Grants Pass, Oregon. Oh. Uh, by the way, I, I live in Oregon. I used to work at uh, Front Range in Colorado, and I moved to Oregon. And Front Range has been wonderful enough to to keep me on, uh, and and helping out. And so uh, I wear that hat a little bit, and I wear a new hat here in Oregon. I'm the project manager for the homelessness response office for Coos County, City of North Bend, and City of Coos Bay. And uh, so most of my information that I'm going to share with you comes from being in that role. Uh, one of the main things that's happening now nationwide is this court case uh, that's on your screen right now. Um, what happened was uh, in Grants Pass, Oregon, it's a small town, uh, there was a case brought by an unhoused person to say it's cruel and unusual punishment to punish me for uh, doing something in public that I'm not supposed to do when there's no shelter space available for me to do it. All right. So if I'm asleep under a tree uh, in a park, you can't call it a crime unless there's somewhere else provided safe that I could go. And it uh, it was it passed in Grants Pass and it has had a incredible ripple effect in the laws through Oregon and is making its way to the Supreme Court. Um, this is a huge deal for people that are experiencing homelessness, because one thing the intended effect is that communities will have to supply shelter beds if they want to arrest anyone unhoused. And of course, you can imagine that that is causing a great deal of resistance. Uh, I have been continuously impressed by the amount of pol polarization uh, that shows up around people that are unhoused. Uh, I'm just going to move over a tab, except my browser is underneath my little thing hide that how do i hide my sharing controls huh that's mean i just do this there we go okay nope no now sorry everybody i'm messing with your screens and i don't mean to come on down and just stay it won't let me all right fine we'll do that we'll go back to this and we'll share again mm. So as Kay mentioned in the beginning, um, uh, one of my early roles in this position was to participate in the point in time count. And uh, this is a nationwide count in an attempt to find out how many unhoused people there are. And, uh, and since I was in a, a somewhat of a leadership role with that, I have access to our this year's count data uh, and some of it's on your screens. Uh, for those of you that are interested in data analytics, um, this is this is uh, the, the background of how it happens. Okay, so um, the point in time count happens in the last week of January. Uh, it happens every year. 
uh, every every geographic area, uh, which is called a continuum of care, is required to at least do it every other year. The reason that it's in the last week of January is that in most places it's cold, so more people that are unhoused will be pushed into shelters and therefore more easy to count. Um, <clears throat> and it turns out here where I live, January is so rainy that people leave in droves because there's no way to stay dry. So our counts always come out low uh, for that reason and many others. Uh, but you can see this little map that zoomed in here a little bit. Is it big enough for you guys to be able to see it? A couple yes. of nods, okay. Yes. So each of these areas with the circle and the number is, is a person. Each number is a person that was counted there. So I actually live kind of right here in this 21 area. Uh, and the Coos County area includes this whole 97. Uh, oh, actually, it's the blue line. So that's all Coos County. So that was our area of responsibility for counting. And uh, HUD offers a great training course, or it says recommendations for doing your pit count. And you have to get started in April. So we're actually getting starting with nominating our pit count committee uh, this month. And anyway, we have to recruit volunteers. And what we do is uh, we pick locations like libraries or service centers. Um, uh, the local one here is called the Devereaux Center, but much like, what was it, Murphy's something that you put up, Charles, in Fort Collins? Murphy Center of Hope. Murphy Center of Hope. Um, odds are that's a pit count location when the pit count's done in Colorado. Uh, so there's these stations that people know to come to. Uh, and then we also recruit volunteers to essentially hike through the woods. And as you can see on that little map, Oregon's got a lot of woods. And so we have a whole team that does what's called the brush count, which uh, involves traipsing through trails, finding camps, and walking up and talking to people, which a lot of people find um, pretty intense, okay, myself included. Uh, you can see the data here on the screen is broken down by race and gender and age. Um, it, it is very true. And unfortunately, uh, the one expression of the increase in family homelessness that Charles mentioned, uh, Oregon actually leads the way. So as far as percent of the unhoused population that is unhoused families, Oregon is number one. Okay. It's certainly not a straight percentage because California would win that on every category, uh, but but we have the highest percent of our unhoused community uh, being being families, and we are working hard to try to do something about that. Okay, so uh, if you want to do something that can greatly impact the unhoused community, volunteer for the pit count. The, uh, it, that's just, anybody can do it. It's an amazing experience to do. And the more accurate the count, uh, the more grant funds you get from HUD, your, your area gets from HUD to, um, to, to distribute through care organizations. Uh, let me click share slideshow. And let's see, bring zoom back up. Share screen and boy, if I do that, it looks like what's going to happen is that it's going to have a whole bunch of black on top and bottom and look really small. Is that what it's doing? Well, yes, you predicted that accurately. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, so that doesn't do it for me. Uh, tell you what, uh, let's just uh, cancel screen sharing over there. And can I do the share part, part of my screen? Boy, it's been a while, that's under advanced portion of screen. Share, and there we go. Yep, it looks good. Now I can drag that there and that there. Okay, this is uh, my local community college. It's called Southwest Oregon Community College. That's the campus right there. Uh, they offer my homelessness response team free office space in a building that is just off the lower right corner of the map. So you can just see the lower right corner of the picture where there's some cars in a parking lot. That's where my office is. But the important part about this picture, 
Well, there's, there's a few things. One, the, the left side curvy road that kind of heads out toward the lake with all the similar looking roofs, that's student housing. So they have their own student, student dormitory system. Uh, past the back of the campus, you can see the lake on the left and you can see some woods. Uh, that's one of the areas that uh, it looks kind of small in the picture. It's actually a pretty good hike to get through all that, um, that we, we counted. And there's a couple of camps back in those woods. And the reason this picture is up here is that one of the first stories I encountered uh, when I started this position was about a young student at Swak who was unhoused. And that student uh, had a camp uh, in the trees back behind campus lived there for three years while finishing a degree at SWAC. He used the sports facilities and gym facilities for showers, the cafeteria for food, uh, essentially spent every day in the library until the library closed and then hiked back to his tent to sleep and came back first thing in the morning. This student, and, and I gotta tell you, this is, this is one of the incredible stories um graduated salutatorian and went off to you know blend back into community right it's uh, a, an amazing feat right now the things that uh you know the, the, when we talk about homelessness that we we're, we're always talking about basic needs and there's a few things that unhoused people really, really need. And this person, uh, the student at SWAC, was able to find a number of them, right? Food at the cafeteria, uh, shelter at least during the daytime, uh, showers uh, that, that a lot of people don't have access to. The things that we're missing uh, are, one was laundry, right? We don't think about it very often, but laundry services are a big deal. In uh, At the Devereux Center here in Oregon, people can wash their laundry once a week. Uh, the other thing is safe storage for your belongings, right? There's nowhere, uh, we, we, we talk about, you know, you used to see people that would walk by someone unhoused and say, you know, hey, get a job, uh, when the reality is this person has everything they own in a cart, and even if they can get a shower and clean clothes and go to an interview, odds are by the time they come out of that interview, their stuff's gone because somebody else walked by, saw their cart, and took it. So safe storage is another huge issue that that we don't tend not to see um this student probably handled that or perhaps just owned nothing i don't know uh, honestly don't know that part of their story so we've talked a little bit about okay i can do that perfect um about these two definitions of homelessness okay the hud definition which is the one that the pit count speaks to uh and uh, you can see that HUD has right here on the slide four categories of homelessness. And the literally homeless is essentially summarized as someone who is habitating in somewhere not designed for human habitation. Okay. So uh, if you're at imminent, imminent risk of homelessness, that means you might be somewhere right now, but within 14 days, you're not going to be there. Okay. Uh, homelessness under other federal statutes gets a little confusing. But unfortunately, it doesn't mean that everyone covered under the McKinney-Vinto Act qualifies. Um, when I read that, I thought, oh, this should be easy, but not so much. Uh, and the last group, which is just horrifying that it's a big enough group to be an entire group, but it is and fast growing, is uh, people fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence. The um, <clears throat> So those are the four main categories and if someone is in those categories and i were to be doing the intake interview with them at the pit count uh, they would qualify as one of those numbers you saw on the screen okay and and i guess i should throw out there that the pit count isn't just a, okay you 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 it's a uh, 20 or 30 questions some of which are invasive spanning gender identity health conditions disability drug use all this kind of stuff so there's a a 10 minute interview with every single person that we count. The McKinney Vinto Act um, specifically does deal with, with school age children and their homelessness, right? And it means individuals, 
individuals who lack a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence. Now, a lot of times when students are unhoused, they have friends who have couches and they can stay on that couch. And here's where we get into one of the really tricky things between McKinney Vintu and HUD is if that person is on a friend's couch and can stay there indefinitely, HUD calls them sheltered. They're housed because they have a house. They're in a house. They have a stable living situation. If a family has lost everything and been taken in by another family, such as they're doubled up in a little house, but they can stay there as long as they want to work it out, HUD considers them housed. Okay? McKinney Vinto does not. So anytime a student is on another family's couch or families are doubled up uh, by the McKinney Vinto definition of homelessness, they can receive support. Okay? So there are these little differences between the two. And one of the big, big, big problems is that um, the school systems don't like to share their data. It's not a wrong or a bad thing, really. It's a sense of protection, right? Uh, we've often talked about the stigma of mental health issues, okay? There is a huge sti stigma about not having homes, not having a house, I should say house, right? And so the McKinney-Vinto liaisons, and this has been our experience just with this last pick count, uh, they are not at all inclined to share information with the people doing the pit count because they want to protect the students and families that they serve. And that's actually going to be one of my big tasks in this next uh, six, seven month period is to start building relationships with the various school districts so that when the next pit count comes, we're on the same page about how we can support people. <sighs> No. <clears throat> so our um, our housing crisis is very, very large. And if you if you Google around, you find all sorts of ideas about what are the root causes of houselessness. And uh, and some of them are up here on the screen now. You can can look at them and read through them. In my experience and uh, in my in my current role, I have met many, many, many people living unhoused. And uh, the root cause, as far as I can tell, is influenced by these things um, and is really trauma. Um, and I think even if you look at this thing that says lo loss of job, well, how much of that is related to trauma, right? lack of health care? Um, it really, really comes down to how can we create safety? If we, if we want to alter someone's path, if we want to support them in, in being able to move back into stable housing, we have to address the issue of the trauma that's happened in their lives. So if we look at us as school, um, and, and I don't have a, a whole lot of educational answer, right? Uh, what I have is the, the bottom line of if we want to support our unhoused students to be able to be successful, we have to find ways to stabilize their basic needs. You know, it's not, you know, the, even the ability to engage academically at all is dependent on, do I know where I'm going to sleep? Do I know if I get to eat today? Right. Those questions have to be answered first. On the right-hand side of this is uh, Maslow's pyramid. And while it's not quite depicted in the picture, what it says is we cannot move on to higher layers of the pyramid if the lower layer isn't met. Okay, so if I if my if I'm worried about where my food's going to come from, I'm not going to be able to do well on an algebra test. It's just not going to happen. And so what can we do? Uh, it comes down to first, stabilize basic needs. And that's what the McKinney and Vinto Act is really trying to do, is to, to provide schools the way to stabilize basic needs of their unhoused students. Beyond that, um, one of the next things we can do is uh, plot prior 
what are what PLAs? Is that what we call them at Front Range? Prior learning yes. assessments. Okay. Uh, those are vital not to get them credit for what they already know, but to get the person accurately placed for their learning, current learning. So administer brief educational assessments. Okay. We can't assume what they've learned or even what they remember. If you can remember a very, very stressful period in your life, how good was your memory? Okay. So learning assessments. Regular check-ins with a teacher or someone on staff that they connect with. And um, it, 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 I think it's safe to say that uh, as we look at rehousing initiatives, one of the things I'm working on is a rehousing initiative, we know that just taking someone who's unhoused and putting them in the house by its, and saying, there you go, doesn't really work. Okay? What we need and what we create, what works, and I have a few examples of wonderful models that work, uh, are wraparound services, case management, counseling when necessary, uh, all that all that kind of support stuff. Uh, with students, the same thing, okay? So finding time each week for new students to check in with their teacher uh, essentially is wraparound support and case management, okay? We can't let someone just come and go from class they need to be able to make connections. Pair them with another student who's willing to play a guiding and supporting role. Right? Uh, Front Range, I believe, still has supplemental instruction, which is sort of an established learning tool, um, but it models that kind of thing. Right? Get them connected to someone specific in the class. Okay? Connection with the teacher, connection with another student. We need structure to adhere to and um, daily routine and clear, concise rules for the classrooms. Right? Something structure that can be depended upon. Oh my goodness, it's only a minute left. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I just got started talking. And so I'm going to just kind of pause there and say thank you. And now we have a minute for questions. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Everybody, we're going to take this recording and we'll put it up. Um, like we said, we don't think we came up. We don't know everything. You know, we don't know the answer. We don't know how to package this and make it a, a nice, neat little discussion. And it should in a in an online class. And we don't think it should be. We shared some of this. Um, what Elena, Leah, and I have been compiling for our research, we're putting it in a folder, a Google folder. You can go in there, use the data, use the journal articles. We'll keep putting things in there. And um, we have to go ahead and close this up now. All right. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank Thanks. Bye-bye. And this is ending. Goodbye.